What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another live event today on LinkedIn, where we are going to talk about Spark performance optimizations. Welcome, everybody. I can see how many people are there, but I would like to ask you to leave a comment if anything's not working fine with regard to the audio or the video that you're seeing. And <clears throat> basically, I would like to show today how we can basically analyze what Spark is actually doing when we are executing a query on a cluster. And that will be a quite hands-on experience as well. So we will implement a small use case. Um, and today's focus is basically to understand the planning steps of the Spark Catalyst, which is basically the query optimization engine that is used by Spark or implemented by Spark. Um, so that we can detect and circumvent the five common performance patterns, um, performance issue patterns in Spark applications. So again, I would like to ask everybody to leave a short comment if everything's working fine. Welcome everybody to this live event. I'm very excited to host another one. I don't know how many have participated in the previous ones. But it's usually been fun and I hope you can take something away from it. Please, everybody also leave a question. Now you have the opportunity to ask anything with respect to performance optimizations. I try to keep it shorter than the last event. So maybe half an hour, I set a timer here and yeah, it's gonna be fine. So today's outline, we are going to implement a small example application, which we are going to inspect then this, um, thanks. Thanks. All right. It seems to be all good. Um, also, let me know if I should increase the font size. That should work as well. So we're going to implement a small example application, which is going to be a window function. And then we're going to look at all the planning step of the catalyst to see how it optimizes our query plan. And we will also inspect the runtime metrics. And these are actually the gold nuggets when we are looking for performance issues because we are going to see or we these allow us to detect performance problems in a sense and yeah if we have the time we can look at automatic optimizations i thought of going through the spark source code with you so for one particular optimization rule that might be maybe interesting but i don't know if we will make it in time so first of all Every Spark application we write has the same structure. So in the beginning, we are loading some data from some source. Then we are basically applying some transformations. Usually we are transforming columns or we are grouping something or joining. So these all would be transformations which don't yield ex um, basically trigger execution on the cluster. And finally, we call an action on the resulting data frame. That's what actually triggers the planning. And um, so all of the planning steps, the code generation, the transformation into the RDD world, and then the execution on the cluster. So that's the distinction between transformations and actions that we see in Spark applications. And basically for now, I would go ahead and implement a small Spark application. So we're going to start. I have a small project here. Um, and I also created a Docker container to run the Jupyter notebook server. And we're going to use that one because it's a little bit easier for inspecting metrics and so on. So usually I like to code in the IDE, but today we are going to use this notebook style. And I can open it now using this token here. And it comes up on the different screen. One second. All right. That I didn't practice, <laughs> obviously. So let's head over to the Jupyter notebook here, and I'm going to create a new notebook. And as usual, let me check the stream again. I lost it. Okay, here we go. So I hope you can read this. Looks good. So the first thing for every Spark application, I don't know who of you has been here in the last live event, we are going to implement a uh, instantiate a spark session which is the central entry point so first of all i would like to start with the imports so from pyspark we need some things.sql 
uh, import Spark session and a window for later. And then from PySpark.sql import all the functions, sql.functions, import all of them. Great, thanks for feedback, Raul. So let's try that one and then create a Spark session, which we're going to call Spark. We're going to use the builder here. And as usual, we set the app name, um, Spark Performance. Here I don't have Vim, which is annoying. Uh, the master. And I think that's it for now. So we only need to call the get or create also no code complete completion here. I really don't like these notebooks so too much. And now we're going to read some data, which I've mounted into this container. And we are going to use the stock market data set again. So we're going to use the Spark data frame reader, which is available through the Spark session, which is the central point to this central entity point to the Spark world. So we can say spark.read, which is a property, no parenthesis here, spark.read and then um, parquet. Hey, Oli, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. I hope you too. So we're going to read data and then I have a basically derived layer which contains the stock data that's already parquet format. And here we're going to read the apple, which I usually work with, usually work with. And we are going to assign this to a data frame variable here. So I can show you quickly if you're interested how I set this up. So I, sim I have a very simple Docker container. Basically, <clears throat> um, setting up some ports, which I basically run through to my local host and then I mount this data directory into the container and also the Jupyter notebooks directory. And that's how it runs. And here's the data which I have pre-processed. So the derived layer already con contains Parquet format, which is derived from the raw layer where the um, basically the CSV files reside. That's what we're doing here. Um, also, this doesn't work with two screens too well. All right. Let's see if that works. DF.show. All right, here we go. The format is a little bit messed up, but that's fine. So now we would like to have a window function, which we're going to analyze then from the planning perspective. So the first thing would be a window spec, which we need. Window spec. And therefore we use the window class um, to get a window specification. So we, on the window, we can call a partition by, partition by, and then we want to partition by the year. So we wanna get the highest closing prices per year as we did in the last video. Um, for those who haven't seen it, the data set is basically, we get one row for each day so one row is a day and for each day we basically get some values for one particular stock so for example the close price that's the price of the stock on that day uh, which it closed with and we get one row for every day and what we would like to do now is to maintain the entire row but only see the rows which have the highest closing price per year so for example for 1980 we want to see only one row and it should be that one with the highest closing price. Let's see if we can see this here quickly. Maybe this one. So this, this row in the year uh, have, has had the highest closing price. Therefore, we are going to use a window function because we would like to see the date as well, not only the year. And therefore we extract the year from the column date. And then we are going to order by basically the column close and that should be in a descending order and that's a function. So we have to add these parentheses here and as a tiebreaker, I forgot a single quote here. 
which is the for the column name for the tiebreaker we would like to sort by the date in an ascending order so that we always see the latest day in the year and that should be our window specification already and now on the df we can call um we can call with column to add a new column which we're going to call rank and here we would like to use the row number and that's a window function therefore we can call the dot over method here and and put the window spec as parameter so that would give us the row number for for each row, uh, for each row within the window so the window is already partitioned by year so the, all the windows are the partitionings and each window is already sorted by the um, closing price in a descending order. <coughs> all right, yeah, I um, have to increase the font size here. I don't know if I can hide this here. Yes. Great. Now we get the row number over the window specification and that will end up being our rank column. And now we use a filter operation and here we need this backslash to tell that our command is going to continue in the next line and we're going to filter the column rank uh, should be of value one so we're only taking the first row from each of the windows and then we can also drop the column rank again like this and this should basically be our result. So let's call it highest closing prices. That's bad practice to have a name like this, but for now we do it. We should always state it in full words. So there's a comment now. Ah, I can use tapped for auto completions. Nice. Let's see. Okay. HC, HC. Ah, here we go. Nice. Not show. Uh -huh. All right. What do we see? Um, 1980. It's been the 29th of December, and the closing price for that day was 0 0.64. And for 1981, it was 0 0.61 on the 2nd of January. So we get one row as expected for each of the years. All right, so that's the functionality we would like to look at. Now, what we can do is to inspect the query plans. That's what we wanted to do. So on this data frame, on the resulting data frame, which was called HCP, we can call dot explain. And explain actually takes arguments. And I want to show you the documentation. So spark.apache.org. Let's increase this. If we go to documentation, latest release, that's what I'm using here. Um, I can look at the API docs for Python. And in here, there's the IP API reference. And here you can see all the classes for PySpark. And we are using a data frame. So in the data frame, there is this explain method that I showed you before or that we were, that we want to use. So here is data frame dot explain. And if I resolve this, it tells us that it prints the logical and physical plans to the console for debug debugging purposes. So that's always something that we can look at if we would like to know what Spark actually does. Now, as I said, it takes one parameter actually two extended and mode and i would like to look at the mode so there are a couple of modes that we can call this explain method with the first one uh, being simple prints only the physical plan and um, extended basically prints all of the plans that are created along the way and there then there's also code gen and cost and formatted so i would like to go with extended because I would like to go through all of the plans with you. Extended. Okay. Now that's large text. All right, we can see that the first plan we see is a parsed logical plan. 
that is actually the very thing that we are creating using the PySpark API. And as I said in the last video as well, it doesn't really matter which language we use to implement a Spark application, um, except for UDFs, because everything that's happening when we use the Spark API is that Spark internally creates this logical representation of our code. So here we can see, for example, we start with, with a relation, which is basically a file read. And here it also says that we are reading Parquet file format. And it also has looked up every all of the fields which are present in the Parquet file. So these are column references from the Parquet file. Then we do a project, which is basically um, we are adding a column or we, are, we basically are changing the column. So a select would also be a project. So if we only selected three columns, we would see the project logical operator here. Then we do a, we do a window function. And within this window function, logical operator, all of the information is present, which we have specified in our code. So it says we are using the uh, function row number. We have a Windows spec definition on the column underscore W0. And we can use this, or we can see actually the project step was necessary because here we added this, this underscore W0 column to our data frame, which is basically the result of extracting the year from the date hashtag one column, which is this column here. So here we basically are grouping by this column, which has an internal name. So it's not a, we didn't de define it. So that's why it has this automatically generated name. And we are sorting by the close price descending um, and the nice should be last. And then also by the date and ascending order. And that's basically all of that, what we have specified in the code and Spark has, has put it into this logical operator here in this parse logical plan. And then we do a project again, basically by dropping the rank only or no, by adding the rank. And then we are doing a project again, and then we filter on the rank. And then we do another project where we actually drop the rank. So that's the parse logical plan. And if I go back to these slides here, that's basically the first step if we call an action. So Spark will go ahead and start from this resolved logic, um, from this parse logical plan. And the first step would be to resolve actually this logical plan. So we start from a, an unresolved logical plan, which is basically the parse logical plan. And these things I already have created. So I've put them into a different format here. So these are logical operators containing all of the information we need to know what should happen with our data. So that's in the logical plan. Then there's the first step where we are going to analyze the logical plan, which means that we are trying to resolve all of the basically symbols we are using here. So for example, in our last step, we have the project, the project logical operator, which for example, uses the close, the close column. And now we have to go back in our logical plan to see if this is even present. So I actually forgot this in our example because I wanted to add a filter, a select statement in the end. So our data frame here, in the end, we would like to do a select and we only wanna see columns date open uh, date close and volume, for example. Okay, should work. So I, I ran the show command again, so that we can see the plan later on. And our data frame is smaller. Um, let's go back to the slides. So here we, for example, we have used a project step, which is the filter, but, uh, not the filter, the select statement actually is a logical project operator where we use three columns and we wanna see if this, for example, close column is even present in the input. And that's what Spark is doing when it's in the first step where it tries to resolve the logical plan. 
or all of these symbols, symbols from a uh, logical plan. So we start from the close price and we scan back. So here in the sort it's present and then in the window function it's present and also in the input it's present. So this field, for example, would be resolved and Spark will do this with all of the fields we are seeing in our logical plan. The second step would be logical optimization. And here it gets a little bit more interesting. Let me go back to the browser because below the parsed logical plan, which is basically like our, that's actually representing our program. And here it's different from our program because it has been, so that's the analyzed plan, sorry. And here's then the optimized plan. So what's happening here is we start from the bottom again. So that's the file relation. So we're reading a data frame in Parquet format. We see the same columns, fine. Then we have the project step where we basically add the year column with a automatically generated name. And then there is introduced in an, a different step, which is called window group limit. And that's happening on our W0 column. And we are going to see in the example on the slides what this window group limit, for example, is. So here are also specified some other things it's, it needs to know. So basically we are grouping by the year, which is this, and then we are sorting by close and date. And then we're applying the row number. Um, yes, and this one, I will, I will uh, tell you later what it means as well. After with the window group limit, we do a window, the window function, which is the same as before. And then we do the filter and then we do the project. So it actually has less steps. Let's look here. This was our analyzed logical plan. That's how we do it in the program. That's the optimized logical plan where we first read a parquet file, then we project it. Then we have the gr window group limit step. Then we have the window step. Then we do the filter and then we do another sort, which we don't have in our example. So that's a slightly different example. So let me see. Yeah, so in, in this example, I added another sort by closing descending, by the close price descending, um, but we don't have it here. So we can disregard the sort down here. Okay, that, that's the optimized logical plan. And then we are transforming this plan again into a physical plan. So here we apply logical optimization rules. For example, the window function becomes a window group limit and a window function or operator. In the physical planning, we take these logical operators and transform them into physical operators. And here happens a lot of performance optimization as well. So for example, the relation logical operator becomes a file scan physical operator. And both of them are reading parquet files. And here we are already adding column pruning because in the end we have basically this projection which only requires us to have the columns um, date, close and volume. And depending on the columns we are using in this entire query, Spark can figure out which, which columns we need to load in the first place. Now Parquet has the advantage that it's a hybrid storage format. So it stores uh, row groups and within the row groups we have vectors of columns. So we can basically prune columns quite easily, also rows, but here we're looking only to uh, on onto column pruning. So we don't have to load all of the columns. So we're only loading date, open and close price because that's the only things we are using in our entire query. Then we do a sort and that sort doesn't happen globally, but actually within each partition. And then we do the window group limit and so on. So I have a more um, illustrated example. So we don't have to go through all of these steps. So to understand what's happening, let's take this physical plan and say we have, we, we're looking at the file scan physical operator here, which has been generated during the degeneration of the physical plan. So this file scan operator basically does the following. This is our, for, let's say this is our input data set. We, we actually have more columns. There would be also volume, adjacent, close and so on. And this is actually partitioned into two partitions. 
Now the column pruning tells Spark that we don't need to load this entire thing, but only column state open and close, also two partitions. So that's one optimization happening in the file scan step. And we can see this in the plan as well. So we go over now to the physical plan. We can see at the very bottom, we have a file scan. So the relation parquet has been translated into a file scan parquet. And here we can see that we are actually loading all of the columns because I haven't added the filter in the end. Exactly. So before we were seeing the old plan where I forgot to um, add the select statement in the very end of the query. Now we can see that we are only loading columns date, date, close and volume because we are selecting on volume, not on close, not on open as in the slides. So that's basically an, has been generated by Spark for us. And we can see it in this physical plan that we only loading three columns. Then we are having a project where we basically introduce the year column and then we do a sort. That's where I actually have, have this information from uh, on the slides. So we sort by year ascending, close descending and then date ascending. So we have basically transformed the grouping condition. So the partitioning condition from the window function we have implemented into a sort on all three columns. Let's see why that makes sense from a performance optimization perspective. So in this first step, that's clear. We reduce the columns. Second step, we introduce a sort which is not global, but happens only within each of the partitions. So we sort partition one first by year and then by close price. So if we're looking only at this yellow partition here, we sort by year, which is the 2022s come first, and then the close price should be descending. So it's ascending here. It doesn't make a difference. It should be descending actually, so that the first row actually has the highest close price. Then the, ah, it's actually, it's correct. Sorry, I made a mistake. So we are sorting, the first sorting criteria is the year. So first is 2022, and that's only two rows for 2022, and then one row for 2023. And the second sort criteria is the close price in a descending order. So the highest close price should be in the end. So all the way here. So we have two times the same close price. And if that's the case, we want to actually see the lower date at uh, the higher date. And here the logic is different because here we are sorting on open as well. So that, that are our three sorting criteria. And we do the same thing for the green partition where we first order by year. So 2022, one row comes first. There's only one row, so we don't need to sort for close. And then we sort for 2023 and the highest close price should be the higher or the earlier row. So that's the idea of the sort here. Now we come to the window group limit which is going to be partial as well. So it's not global. And what we, so that's our input data frame as we had it on the last slide. And what we do here is basically that we are already limiting the results from the grouping to one row. So that's actually a quite smart thing to optimize because each partition only keeps one row for each of the years. That's why we did the sorting. So for 2022, we can already cancel out this row because we know that we're only going to need this one. And that's actually the idea of the window group limit. We are basically applying the window function as we have specified in the code for each partition. So we don't look at the entire data, but we do the very same logic for each of the partitions. So we, in each of the partitions, we have only one row for each of the years which is present in the partition. And that's what I put here. So for partition one, this is these are the highest closing prices per year. And these are the highest closing prices per year for the second partition. Is it half past six already? Oh my God. All right. So 
now we haven't had we haven't seen any exchange yet so no shuffle has happened so we have worked only within each of the partitions now the next step would be to have a to have to do the exchange what we do is we only write the highest close price rows for each of the partitions and exchange them so that we be basically using a hash shuffle of the year so that all rows for one year end up in one partition and that's happening here so that's our input data frame on the top again so all of the rows for 2022 end up being in partition one and all of the rows for 2023 end up in the partition two in the green one and these are only the highest closing prices per year from the previous partitions now we do another sort because we want to sort by the highest closing price so we basically sorting by close descending and select the first rows again so we end up only with these two rows so what's happening we are reducing the rows within each of the partitions only to the ones that we are going to need downstream in the next stage and then we do another sort and then we actually doing the filter on or basically only selecting the first row and spark has figured out that or has figured that out for us from the query we wrote and then we are basically applying the actual window function only keeping so um, basically numbering the rows and only keeping the first um only keeping the first rank here by the filter and then we do an exchange again which we don't have so these two steps we don't have because the the last sort we don't have it in our example so that's the idea of this and i don't know if you are familiar how spark actually um transforms this into the rdd world it actually cuts our plan into stages where we have only narrow dependencies so every exchange every shuffle will cut a stage and everything else will be put into the same stage and for one stage it will actually generate code which it will execute in the rdd execution model but that's basically out of the scope and also out of our performance optimization things in spark sql now now this is the entire planning yeah procedure we're following so we have our data set api we are writing an application which will result in an unresolved logical plan which is actually a tree of logical operators and in the first step spark will actually look at all of the symbols we're using and see if they are actually present in the file and and whatever so if we if you for example have a typo in the column name um spark will actually fail here quite early in this in this process because it it will tell us that this column name is not actually present in the data frame and then we apply logical optimizations basically by reordering operators and so on and then we will end up with a logical optimized logical plan here already the window function or the window operator was split up into a window group limit and window operator so in two operators and then we do the physical planning where we replace logical operators with physical operators and then it applies a cost model so it, it actually generates multiple physical plans um applies a cost model selects one and then basically generates code for the rdd world all right now that's basically maybe a little bit too much now what i wanted to show you as well is if we go back to our notebook here we have walked through this plan what i want to show you is now we can also see these we can also use the spark web ui and the last this one should be the last execution so if we go to the sql tab up here we can see actually what had what has happened maybe i have to increase this one all right so here we can see what happened first we have a scan parquet so there's only one file we don't deal with too much data so it's roughly ten thousand rows there's a lot of information very helpful information um it also says says us the size of the files 
and how long it takes and so on. But here, nothing too um, like spectacular is happening. Um, and then we see this first stage. So for that stage, Spark has actually generated code. We can see it whole stage code gen stage. So this is basically the transformation from the Parquet file format to a data frame. We transform the column, uh, columnar uh, row uh, format to rows so that we basically have a data frame. Then we do the projection. We introduce the column year. And then we do the sorting. And as you can see, this is one stage. So each of the tasks will work within the default partitions. So we load this data into partitions and all of that, what is specified within this blue block here, will be done within the partitions. So here we can see that we have a sort. So here we can see that it takes 48 milliseconds and here's the peak memory used, which is not too much, but it's 2.2 megabytes. Um, this is actually something to watch out for if you are trying to optimize performance. So here you want to be below the memory which is available on your executors. The actual thing that you want to look out for is the total spill size. And spill actually happens if the memory of the executor is too small to hold all of the data for one partition. And if we see any spill, that is already a severe performance or it's, it's already an implication that you have a performance issue or that you need to either look at your query if you could optimize something there or if you need to add more resources to um, your workers to actually be able to hold the data for each of the partitions. So you want to have, you don't want to have spill or at, at least as possible. Then we see the window group limit. And now that's an that's a question which may be interesting for you. It says we have 41 output rows after the sort. Now we can think why are there 41 rows in the output of the window group limit? Because the number of input rows is almost 10k. And the answer is actually, we have actually 41 years in our data set. So as I said before, in the window group limit, we keep one row for each year in each of the partitions. So we are already reducing basically the 10,000 rows to 41 rows, because we only need one row for each year. And we have 41 uh, years in our data. I can I can prove this by saying df select uh, year of date distinct should be a function count should be a function. It's 41. So that's actually what's happening. So we get 41 output rows after the window group limit. So that's drastically reducing our file size before, even before we do the first shuffle. So only 41 rows have, have to be written to disk so that the other, um, so the downstream executors can fetch them. So here we can see the exchange. That's where data is reshuffled so that all of the years end up in one partition. So basically all rows for one year end up in one partition. And here we can see shuffle records written. Um, total data size written is only uh, one kilobyte, actually. Uh, local bytes read, 2.9 kilobytes. Shuffle bytes written. Yeah, that's what's happening. And then we have a shuffle read and here the AQE kicks in, which is the um, adaptive, adaptive query execution. 
Um, and one of the adaptive query execution mechanisms is to automatically optimize the shuffle partitions. And here Spark actually sees that we are only loading roughly three kilobytes of data, and therefore we will only load one partition. So it has basically added a statement for us to load all of the data into one single partition, um, because it wouldn't make sense to have 200, partition, 200 partitions for 41 records. And that's the AQE shuffle read. And then we do the whole, uh, we have another stage, which is the, the second sort, where we sort within each of the years. And then we do the window group limit and the output is now only 22 rows. Why is it only 22 rows? Because the show actually limits our output to only 20 rows and Spark says, okay, I don't, I don't need to basically find all of the years. It's enough if I find 22 years. So that's another optimization. And then we actually apply the window function, do the filter to only have rank one, and then do the projection where we basically only select the, um, the three columns. So date, close, and volume, I think it was for us. And then it basically, yeah, prints it to the console. And that's basically what's happening. Um, let me go back to the slides. So that is out of scope. Um, I hope this has become clear, how you can inspect the query plans. And now I wanna do a reference to the five most common performance problems. And actually the five most common performance problems with um, like Spark applications start, is called the five S's. So all of the five start with an S. The first one being this data skew. And skew means actually that one partition is much larger than all of the other partitions. And how would we detect data skew if we looked at the metrics we see here? Now, the first thing is, if we look at these jobs here, we can also see how long it took for each of the tasks to complete. So in the count, for example, we can see, I mean, now we have only basically one task because we only have one partition. But if we have, for example, 200 partitions and we can see that one, part, one partition, one task runs like 10 times as long as the second longest task, we can already um, tell that we have data skew. And we can also see the number of records for each of the tasks. I think it was in the same, in the same view. So here you always have the number of records specified. So here's the shuffle read, for example, and it only reads one record. I think it was the count actually, which I'm looking at here. So that, that's what we can look at to detect data skew, which is this um, timeline here. The second one being shuffle. And the shuffle performance problem is when one of the tasks has to write a lot of data when we're exchanging data and all of the others have to write much less data. And as we have seen, for example, the window function gets optimized by Spark that we write as low shuffle data as possible by already reducing the rows as much as possible based on the logic we have in our query. All of these optimizations are actually only possible if we use the Spark, so the declarative Spark SQL API and not basically custom implemented um, user-defined aggregation functions or anything like that. Spark cannot optimize them because it doesn't understand the logic that we write in Python or Scala, for example. So therefore, it is very, very important to only use the Spark SQL defined functions. Um, the third performance ob obstacle starting with S is the spill, which I have showed you before. Um, you can see how much data has been spilled to disk and you want this to be, to be as small as possible. Otherwise you have to reschedule your cluster or look at your query again and not reschedule your cluster. You will have to reconfigure your cluster, adding more resources or adding more workers and more partitions. But you wanna you wanna make sure that each partition in your query f 
fits into the memory which is available for each of the executors. And then there we have scan, which basically relates to file scanning. So we want to reduce as much data as possible that we load from our data source. And as we've seen, Spark also optimizes this by basically doing a column pruning or also um, partition pruning. So we can skip entire partitions or entire columns and we can push this down into the data source directly. For example, like, like we did here, only loading a subset of columns. Yeah, and that's basically what I wanted to show you. Now I would like to, I mean, it's it's far too long again, I'm sorry, but I hope you found this interesting. If you have any question, you have some time now to ask them into the chat, into the chat, and I will try to answer them. Yes, until you do that, I have some more slides, so we can, didn't get to that. So I wanted to show you how Spark actually um, applies logical optimizations, for example, if we had a query plan, so this is a logical plan again. If we had a query plan, which has a join, and after the join, there's a filter, there would be an automatic rule basically to switch the order of the two. So because if we have the filter before, the join will be smaller and we have to write less data to disk during the shuffle. So that's one optimization rule that will be applied. <clears throat> and the second one be, we, we could also then in a subsequent run, so we, we apply all of the rules as often as we, until we reach a fixed point in this tree optimization here, we would apply all of the rules again until nothing changes anymore. But in the second step, we would have another optimization rule, which, which basically combines the filter, the filters into one single filter. And that I wanted to look at with you in the Spark source code, but maybe we'll get the chance to do it next time. I don't see any questions yet. So if you have a question, please type it. Otherwise I do a short advertisement for the stuff I do. I actually have a mailing list and you can see the URL. Now it's opening it. Too bad, let me switch the layout. So I would also put it in the show notes. I have a mailing list where I write, where I send you one email every week containing very helpful Spark learning or basically bite-sized spark learning resources the idea is to provide helpful information for you or for everyone learning spark if you would like to sign up use this url here also i offer individual coaching in one-on-one -on -one sessions you can book it under academy.philip-bronenberg.de and I will help you to become a pro level Apache Spark engineers, engineer in 12 weeks by implementing a project with you, giving you individual feedback, reviewing your code and answering all of the questions you may have. We talk about internals, optimizations. I would show you how to write code in a professional manner and all of these things. You can participate in any language of your choice. So Scala, Python or Java are all fine. If you're interested, reach out to me. We can schedule a call or go to academy.philipmanisbronberg.de. All right, now there is a question. Actually, I cannot see all of the comments from LinkedIn as I experienced, but there's one. Since we have query optimizer in Spark, do we need to worry about writing optimized code? So the number one rule, I would argue, is that we don't use UDFs or user-defined aggregation functions. Whenever you do that, Spark can actually do nothing for you. As long as you are using the API, even with concepts like the window function, you have seen how vastly it can optimize your query. And usually it's, it's very good at optimizing your performance. Also, what I've seen sometimes is that we have actually a error or basically a mistake in our business logic which for example leads to an explosion before a join so what, then you join these columns and you, you become an exponential number of rows after the join um, so that you have to take care of yourself as well so i would argue that these are the most common performance killers to use custom code so to write udfs and if you have a basically a mistake in your business logic. I thought my laptop was dead, but it isn't, fortunately. 
All right, let's go back here. There are more questions. Will the... Yes, the video will be available after it ends for some time on LinkedIn. I will also download it from LinkedIn and upload it to YouTube. And we'll make it available there. Yes, thanks for leaving feedback. I hope you, or I'm glad you enjoyed it, obviously. I will post it on YouTube as well, and I will share the link on LinkedIn. I will also share the link in my mailing list, so sign up for the mailing list. No, kidding. Um, I think... Yes, go go through it on yourself again. Set up this um, Jupyter note, notebook and implement everything yourself and inspect what's happening. It's very helpful to get hands-on experience. That's actually the most important thing. And you will feel much, much more confident after you have done it yourself. So, great. Some LinkedIn user, I don't see your name, but thanks for leaving feedback. Um, I really enjoyed it again. And yeah, I will probably host another LinkedIn Live event next week or in two weeks. The topic is to be released. Until then, I wish you all a pleasant week, a good evening or a good day, depending on your time zone. And I'm looking forward to see you in the next session. Until then, bye-bye. Thanks for joining.